Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We'd love to have you join us. In our last lesson, we ended with the Solomon's dedicatory prayer of Solomon's temple, the house of God. A truly fantastic accomplishment for the nation of Israel. But God was telling Solomon and all of Israel and us the main lesson, I think, that I hope you will take out of Chronicles toward the end of that lesson. And that is, if you will keep God in focus in your life, keep, keep in touch with Him, don't, don't uh, forsake Him, because if you forsake Him, He will forsake you. Do things His way and receive His blessings. Things go well for you and your children. But um, then he ended it with, if you forsake me for other gods, then I will forsake you. And I'll make this house, the, uh, the Solomon's temple, an example, and you'll be a laughing stock to the nations who come by, and you'll be a proverb and a byword, God said. So don't do things his way. Don't expect his blessings. And we come to chapter 8. Uh, we're going to pick it up in... Uh, just as David, the, we saw the first half of his life, uh, was all on the upside, upside, ascending, if you will. Then, about uh, 20 years into his reign, things started going south. That's when the issue with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite might come to mind, came to pass. And things went downhill for David from that point forward. Uh, God said the sword will never pass from your house, and God meant it. Uh, there was a lot of violence in David's house. But just as things started about halfway through the reign, uh, David started not being such a good king. The same thing happened to Solomon. Uh, and Solomon reigned for the same number of years that his father David, 40 years. And we're going to pick it up today that we're at the 20th year. Uh, so far, Solomon has been doing things God's way, and the blessings have come toward Israel. Israel grew uh, tremendously, both uh, geographically, uh, by population census, and also uh, by economy uh, through the reigns of David and Solomon. Things, things were going good. So let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name with that introduction. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up. Second Chronicles chapter 8, verse 1, and it reads, And it came to pass at the end of twenty years, wherein Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house. Now, uh, 20 years were halfway. And remember, Solomon was but 20, 19 or 20 years old when he began to reign. So right now he's about 40 years old. Now, the house of God we learn in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 38, that it took some seven years, a little over seven years, to complete Solomon's own house. Uh, was, as we read in 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 1, took 13 years. And it was really more than a house, it was a complex. Uh, within, you not only had the sleeping uh, quarters for Solomon, and remember he had a whole bunch of wives and a whole bunch of concubines to, to bed down when it came time to bed down, but he also had other buildings in the complex. The, uh, the house... Uh, of, um, uh, what was it, uh, the house of, I'm going to find it here, and it's Lebanon. And the house of Lebanon, it was where he, uh, his throne was there, so he definitely passed judgment there when he heard cases. But it was also an area that he could receive ambassadors from foreign countries. It was quite a show place, quite fancy. Verse 2. 
that the cities which Huram, this is Hiram and the kings, had restored to Solomon, uh, Solomon built them and caused the children of Israel to dwell therein. Now, there's not much written about this event here, not anywhere near as much as we learn in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 10, in the following verses. But what had happened was Solomon had put up 20 cities in Galilee as collateral uh, for a loan from Huram. Uh, Huram went down, though, to uh, probably unexpectedly to inspect these 20 cities, and he sent word to Solomon. He said, why did you give me this Kabul for, is the word. Kabul means pond or, or good for nothing. And he made Solomon take the 20 cities back, and no doubt if it was security for a loan, Solomon had to come up with another way to secure the loan. But uh, so what Solomon's doing here is it said he built the cities. That's not a very good word translated. It's more rebuilt the cities, maybe restored them, if you would, and then moved Israelites. They were uh, they were occupied at the time he gave them to Hiram or Huram uh, by the descendants of the Canaanite tribes. Verse 3, And Solomon went to Hamath Zobah and prevailed against it. Now, what has happened there? Uh, David uh, conquered both, uh, at the time of David, both Hamath and Zobah had their own king individually. And David defeated both of those peoples and put them under tribute. Uh, when a powerful king dies and a new young king takes over, uh, people tend to test the resolve of the young king. They thought, aha, here's a time for us to quit paying the tribute that David put us under because uh, Solomon won't have the power to do anything about it. But uh, Solomon uh, obviously uh, proved them wrong and uh, the, uh, overcame the insurrection that was raised up against him and Israel. <clears throat> Solomon is uh, financing his building appetite, which was considerable. Verse 4, And he built Tadmor in the wilderness, in all the store cities which he built in Hamath. Now, which these would be would be strongholds, uh, probably fortified with gates and walls that would be defensible, but he would keep uh, weapons, uh, probably house soldiers, military type people, and that was a good plan, a good strategy. He, he, he spread out the resources across the nation rather than having everything in Jerusalem. That way, if a problem occurred, there, it would not be that uh, great a distance for the military to travel. Now, he built Tadmor. Again, that word built should be he rebuilt or fortified. Uh, Tadmor had been around for centuries and centuries. Uh, the, the word Tadmor, uh, many of you who are, have somewhat working knowledge of the Hebrew language know that Tamar, the female's name, means palm tree. And in fact, the ancient Greeks and Romans called this same place, Tadmor, Palmyra. Uh, it was situate in an important location because the Suez Canal was not in place at the time of these events. Uh, and what they would do, they would have caravans, and the purpose of the caravans would, they'd have ships bring merchandise on the Red Sea uh, or the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea, the Persian Gulf, I meant to say, rather than the Red Sea. But then they would unload, well, once they arrived on the shore, they would unload their cargo, loaded on camels or donkeys, and then take it over land to the Mediterranean or the Persian Gulf, depending on which direction the goods were being moved, and then load them on ships, and then they would go by sea again. So uh, it was important to have a military presence there because of that caravan uh, to protect uh, them from thieves, uh, bandits, etc. Verse 5, Also he built Beth-Horan, the upper, 
and Beth Haran, the nether, or the lower, you could have translated. Fenced cities with walls, gates, and bars. These gates would be uh, double doors that they could uh, take a, a metal bar, steel bar, and place it in place, and it would be very uh, secure as far as uh, a, a defense against an enemy. And these were important, Beth Haran, uh, lower and the upper, uh, because they were in a situation where they could protect the mountainous areas, not only of Judah, but also Benjamin uh, and uh, Ephraim. Verse 6, And Baalath and all the store cities that Solomon had, and all the chariot cities, and the cities of the horsemen, and all that Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, and in Lebanon, and throughout all the land of his dominion. Ba Baalath and Dan is important for protection uh, against the Philistines. Now, uh, a chariot, oftentimes you, I would think of it as a vehicle with wheels that would be drawn by two, maybe three, sometimes even four horses. Uh, but chariot can mean just a horse uh, and the rider, and what, what I would think of as Calvary. <clears throat> now Solomon did a lot of building in Jerusalem. Uh, he built a wall completely around the temple complex, and that was made of very expensive wood that they obtained from Ophir when they went to get the gold. More on that toward the end of this lecture. But uh, the, and this word Lebanon here, bad translation, it should have been the house of Lebanon, and we'll have more details about it uh, in a future lesson as well. But and again, that whole complex uh, surrounding his palace, his living quarters, uh, was very uh, ornate, very well built. Uh, they used woods that were imported uh, by uh, the king of Tyre and uh, from Huram and, and his accomplices. Verse 7. As for all the people that were left of the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which were not of Israel. Now, as many of you know, these are uh, Canaanitish tribes. That's Canaanite with a C, not Kenite with a K. Now, uh, God instructed uh, Moses and Israel to annihilate these people. Uh, make a note of Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. And God tells Moses there, you know, these seven nations, uh, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, and so on, are much greater than you. But I'm going to give you the victory over them, uh, but I insist that you completely wipe them out, annihilate them. Because if you don't, then you're going to be giving... Uh, your daughters to their sons for wife. You're going to be taking their daughters to your sons for wife. And before you know it, uh, you're going to be worshiping their gods, small g. Well, they gave their daughters to their sons and took daughters for their sons. And they did indeed end up worshiping their gods. God knew what he was talking about. Verse 8. But of their children, the descendants of the Canaanites we're talking about, who were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel consumed not, them did Solomon make to pay tribute until this day. Now, many of these had no money. So uh, what they would do is pay for their tribute with forced labor. Uh, you may recall in one of our early lectures in Second Chronicles, that he had a workforce of some 153,600 to build not only Solomon's temple, but his own private house as well. That included people working in the forest, uh, cutting wood, and also working in the quarries, cutting stone for these buildings. But again, if they didn't have money, he would put them to work as forced labor. But of the children of Israel, now we switch gears, we're not talking about the Canaanites anymore, did Solomon make no servants for his work, 
but they were men of war and chief of his captains and captains of his chariots and horsemen, the Israelites. He didn't put to forced labor, and that actually would be illegal uh, under law. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 25, uh, if your brethren, which would be someone of Israel, landed on hard times, they could sell themselves into bondage. That was completely legal. But if an Israelite was to treat another Israelite that had become his bondman as a day servant, as he would treat any other laborer, in other words. Now, there were provisions in the law that if a bondman liked his boss and his home that he had been provided, and many times the uh, master would give a wife to the bondman. And, and then in case, of course, that case, children were the result. But if a bondman came to the end of his seven years and left, he had to leave his wife and his children. So there were instances uh, where the people would want to, the bondmen would want to stay in bondage, and there were provisions in the law that allowed that. Uh, uh, that, and that was quite common, verse 10. And these were the chief of King Solomon's officers, even 250 that bear rule over the people. Now we're talking again about the Canaanites, and he had 250 Israelites that were supervisors or straw bosses over the Canaanites. Now this is at odds with 1 Kings uh, chapter 9, verse 23, where it states that he had 550 rulers. Uh, that difference can be explained in the fact that 250 here were of Israel, the other 300 were of the uh, tribes, the Canaanite tribes, and came from their ranks. Verse 11, and Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David unto the house that he had built for her. For he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy whereunto the ark of the Lord hath come. Now, the fact that Solomon didn't want this wife to live in what was sanctified as holy indicates that he knew this was wrong. Uh, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, when the people of Israel said, Lord, we want a man king to rule over us like the other nations have. And God said, and gave him a list there of things that if he decided to give them a king, which he eventually did, that a king was to do and a king was not to do. A king was not to multiply wives to himself. That's one area where uh, Solomon had a real problem. He had 600 wives and 300 concubines. I, I can't even imagine what that must have been like. It also says in Deuteronomy 17 that a king was not to return to Egypt to get horses. Why? Because Israel, he had delivered Israel out of bondage to the Egyptians. And so not only did Solomon go back and get horses, as we learned in the first couple chapters of Second Chronicles, he went back to Egypt and got a wife. Now, uh, and again, he knew something was wrong. And as he got older, uh, Solomon took on more and more foreign wives. Ammonites, Moabites, you name it, uh, he had them in his harem. And the problem is that he allowed them to build little altars to their gods on Mount Moriah and Mount Zion, uh, the Temple Mount. And Solomon himself uh, gave in and worshiped their gods. That was the reason that it angered God so much that uh, the nation of Israel broke up that's when the ten northern tribes became Israel and Judah uh, became a, a separate nation on its own. Verse 12, Then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord which he had built before the porch. Uh, what this is saying, and you may recall in an earlier chapter when Solomon first became king, 
he went to Gibeon and offered sacrifice. And that's when God appeared to him in a dream the first time and Solomon and asked Solomon, what can I give you? And Solomon asked for wisdom, which the Lord gave him abundantly. But what this is saying is that at this point in time, 20 years into his reign, he no longer went to Gibeon to offer sacrifice. And of course, he didn't offer uh, sacrifice. Uh, the priest would do it for him, obviously. But uh, he would, was offering sacrifice in Jerusalem rather than going to Gibeon being the point. Verse 13, even after a certain rate every day, the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice, offering according to the commandment of Moses on the Sabbaths and on the new moons and on the solemn feast three times in the year, even in the feast of unleavened bread and in the feast of weeks and in the feast of tabernacles. He's uh, keeping the statutes uh, and uh, the, the of the holy days, keeping the law. That's, that's a good thing to do. Uh, David would have been pleased by Solomon doing that. Uh, uh, in these moons, I think, that the Israelites did not have a celebration or a holy day every first month. And then when you say moons, we're talking about months. Uh, the Tishri, the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, there was a, a holy day on the first day. It's called the Feast of Trumps. Tishri, the seventh month, was a very special month on the Hebrew calendar. You had on the 10th of Tishri the Day of Atonement. On the 15th, you had the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, there was a feast after that, Atzeroth in the Hebrew tongue. And then the civil year began, not the calendar year, but the civil year when the courses of the priest uh, began. And in verse 14, And he appointed according to the order of David his father, the courses of the priests to their service and the Levites to their charges to praise and minister before the priest. The singers and musicians uh, were Levites. As the duty of every day required, the porters, which would also be Levites, also by their courses at every gate. For so had David, the man of God, commanded. And God wrote all of the instructions for the temple and the worship on David. And then David communicated those to Solomon. What this is saying is that once that the house of God, Solomon's temple, was complete, that they didn't mess around. They immediately implemented the courses of the priest. You may recall that they had a seven-day feast prior to the Feast of Tabernacles the, for the dedication of the temple. Then they had the Feast of Tabernacles. Immediately following that would be the beginning of the civil year. That is no doubt when they uh, instituted the courses of the priest, not only the priest, but of the Levites who had other responsibilities in and around the temple, the singers and the musicians. Uh, the porters, the doorkeepers were security, if you will. Verse 15, And they departed not from the commandment of the king, and this referring to King David, uh, unto the priest and Levites concerning any matter or concerning the treasures. Now there were actually two distinct treasures in the house of God. Uh, one of them was the treasury of dedicated things. Uh, descendants of Moses were responsible for uh, oversight of that particular treasure. And then you had Gershonites who were responsible for the treasury of the house of God. The treasury of dedicated things, I'll remind you, went all the way back to the time of Moses when they had victory over enemies they would take part of the spoils of war and dedicate it to uh, the house of God. Verse 16, <clears throat> Now all the work of Solomon was prepared 
unto the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord, and until it was finished, so the house of the Lord was perfected. In other words, it was perfected uh, by commencement of the courses of the priest and the Levites. And again, no doubt that happened as soon as the house of God was dedicated and the Feast of Tabernacles uh, was uh, celebrated. Then went Solomon to Ezion Geber and to Eloth, also called Eloth in, in other places, at the seaside in the land of Edom. Now, Edom was situated on the southeast of Israel. Uh, you have the land of, of Ammon and Moab north of Edom, but Edom went all the way to the Persian Gulf. And it gave uh, Solomon and those who were doing the shipping business a port on the Persian Gulf. It's called the Gulf of Aqaba uh, even to this day. But that gave Solomon a place to launch these large ships, seagoing ships that were often called the ships of Tarshish, uh, you may recall. And uh, as we'll see in our next verse, Huram, the king of Tyre, also got involved with that. And again, this would be a little doubt in the second half of Solomon's reign. And Huram sent him by the hands of his servants, ships and servants, that had knowledge of the sea. The Israelites did not. Uh, they, they were nomadic tribes people. And they went with the servants of Solomon to Ophir and took thence 450 talents of gold and brought them to King Solomon. Ophir, uh, we learn in chapter 9, verse 21, uh, with the uh, queen of Sheba's visit that they went to Ophir every three years. These ships would launch and bring back uh, untold quantities of gold. Uh, they also brought back monkeys, uh, apes, they're called in the, the Old Testament, uh, precious stones, uh, abundance of them, and, and also this algum or almug, depending on whether you're in Kings or Chronicles, uh, wood, which was used uh, not only for the walkways, the stairways that uh, were formed a walkway from Solomon's palace up to the house of God, but also they had rails, fancy rails. It's even thought by some scholars that this was a covered walkway. So um, they also uh, made of this algum or almug, depending on whose book you're in, but they made uh, musical instruments, and it's thought that it's uh, very similar to uh, red rosewood that you might see in guitars of today. But uh, the Queen of Sheba is on the way to visit Solomon. Uh, she's going to be very impressed with the wealth of Solomon, but you know, Solomon in the uh, book of Ecclesiastes and, and, and Proverbs, he said, you know, I, I got me uh, men singers and women singers. I had gold and silver like nobody's business, uh, but it's all vanity. Uh, and you, you know, when you leave God out of your life and you only focus on riches of the world, all is vanity. You know why? Because you can't take it with you when you die. I don't care how big of a checking account or a savings account you have, when you die, it's going to your, your descendants or whoever is your beneficiary. It's not going with you to heaven. Chapter 9, verse 1, let's go with the Queen of Sheba uh, coming to check out what she'd heard about King Solomon. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard or difficult questions at Jerusalem with a very great company, and camels that bear spices, and gold in abundance, and precious stones. Sheba is obviously a very wealthy nation. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. She tested his wisdom with riddles, is what is going on. Now, Sheba, also called 
Saba uh, is thought to be in Arabia. I meant to say too earlier that Ophir, the location of Ophir was lost at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, which would be some 400 years after Solomon. And uh, it's thought that Ophir, where these gold and the precious stones and fancy uh, woods, expensive woods came from, was either in northern Africa, uh, some people put it in Arabia, uh, some people even say that it's India. But she's come, she's brought a lot of gifts for Solomon, and she's going to check out uh, what, what I have heard about the wisdom of Solomon. Is it really true? Uh, she probably heard about the wisdom of Solomon from the ships of Tarshish on their voyages to Ophir. Verse 2, And Solomon told her all her questions, and there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not. He was able to answer all of her riddles, and don't ever forget, though, where Solomon's wisdom came from. It came from uh, Yahweh. Verse 3, and when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built, this referring to Solomon's uh, palace, not the house of God, quite obviously, verse 4, and the meat, or the put for all food, of his table, and the sitting of his servants, the furniture, in other words, and the attendants of his ministers, the arrangement and the organization of his offices and officers, and their apparel and his cupbearers also, cupbearers could be thought of as butlers, and their apparel and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit or breath in her. She was beside herself. All that she had heard about Solomon was true and then some. And uh, she's quite smitten. This ascent, I was talking earlier about out of the algum or alma wood, uh, they made a walkway from the complex where Solomon's house was up to the house of God. So we'll come back in our next lecture. We're out of time for today, but uh, we'll come back and finish up uh, the Queen of Sheba's visit, and also at the end of chapter 9 covers the death of King Solomon. Don't miss it. we got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment. Won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we try and teach God's Word in a positive format. Uh, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world other than the U.S. and Canada, not able to use that 800 number, in other words, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, we can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. Talk to your Heavenly Father. He's there for you 24-7. 
and I encourage you to use that avenue of communication that your father developed, that you can talk to him any time of the day, no matter where you're at. Talk to your father. Make time each day. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. Uh, health issues, Father. Uh, financial difficulties, you know. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up, we have Randall in Florida. Who wrote the Bible? Who first published the Bible? Well, we learn in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, the early ancient copies of the Bible were, of course, handwritten, and they would take large scrolls of uh, papyrus, or paper material, uh, some uh, even on leather, and would write the Bible out by hand on that. Now, of course, the invention of the printing press uh, albeit uh, not anything like what we have today, but uh, it was something of an accomplishment in the 1500s. Uh, the, one of the first things that were produced in mass quantities by, by these printing presses were Bibles. So uh, that brought about the first printed versions of the Bible. Johnny in Oklahoma, why was the book of Enoch left out of the Bible? Well, because most people don't think that it should have been canonized uh, and it wasn't canonized even in the uh, uh, Masera, or I should say in the original 1611 King James Version Bible, uh, you have the Apocrypha, but Enoch was not even one of the, in the books of the Apocrypha. Now, uh, we don't offer that in our library, so I guess that kind of tells you what we think about it, although there's nothing wrong with a mature Christian reading anything that he wants to read. You should be able to analyze whether it lines up with God's Word or not, and if it doesn't, it, it definitely should not have been part of the Bible. Samuel and Marilyn, what did Jesus do from the age of 18 through 30? Well, he's last written of about the age of 12, actually, uh, until he is 30. So from the age of 12 through 30, uh, he disappears in the Bible. You know, he's teaching in the temple when he was 12. The next thing you know, he's 30 years old. So what did he do between the time that he was 12 teaching in there and when his ministry came in when he was about 30? We have a book that we offer here. It's a, not a biblical account, but it's a historical account. It's called the Traditions of Glastonbury. And uh, his uncle, or actually his mother's uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, was known as the Tin Man. And he made voyages to the British Isles, to England. And Glastonbury is located in southern England. And Jesus is thought to have, uh, and, and this documentation uh, proves that he was with Joseph of Arimathea historically. Mark in New York, Psalms 51, what is iniquity? In Psalm 51 verse 2, iniquity, the Hebrew word is avon. It means, uh, it's from the prime Hebrew word ave, which is perversity. Uh, that's to say, uh, morally, it is evil, if you will. It has been translated as sin in the King James Version Bible. When I think of iniquities, I think of sins or shortcomings. Margie in Texas, how do you get a demon out of your house? Well, uh, you want to know what you're doing. Uh, I would f first recommend you obtain some olive oil. Uh, you can get it at a grocery store, 100% virgin olive oil. Uh, go to a pharmacy and ask them to purchase a small vial, and you put a small amount of the oil in the vial, and then in prayer you ask God to bless the oil. 
and promise him that you'll use it in obedience to him. Uh, the rest of the oil you can use it, it has many uses, cooking, uh, it's good for your skin, etc. But then uh, take a small amount on your index finger, go to the doorway of your home, and in prayer you order that all evil and negative out of your home in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't forget the in the name of Jesus Christ part. If you're not spiritually mature, I would advise you to get someone who is spiritually mature uh, to help you with that task. Margie in Texas. Oh, we did that one. Donna in Pennsylvania. Who was Cain afraid of when God sent him out of Eden? Well, the people who were created in Genesis chapter 1, uh, the sixth day creation we refer to them. Uh, in Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 16 and 17, it states that Cain was uh, sent out of the Garden of Eden and he went east into the land of Nod and took a wife. Uh, you see, now that's kind of hard for people that think that Adam and Eve were the only people on earth at the time to explain who was Nod, how did he have a daughter old enough for Cain to marry. Uh, they weren't descendants of Adam and Eve, they were descendants of the people who were created in Genesis chapter 1, the sixth day creation. Cain was not Adam's son. It's easily documented in Genesis chapter 5 where you have the genealogy of Adam. You won't find uh, Cain there. You won't find Abel there either. Why? Because Cain murdered him before he had was old enough to have children. No children, no genealogy. Rebecca in Kentucky, what is the seventh Vial. Well, you'll find that in Revelation 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And what happens then? The seventh trump, and Jesus returns. The second advent begins. I say, Come, Lord Jesus, come. He's the only one who can straighten this mess out. Carol in Texas. When the fallen angels took them to wife, were the women able to live through giving birth to a giant? I assume the marriage was rape. There's nothing said in the Bible about that in Genesis chapter 6 being rape. Does the Bible give any information about this? I'm, I'm sure that the children of the Nephilim grew up to be giants. They weren't necessarily giants when they were born. The, the, we had a little fun with this in the office the other day and uh, we took off with your thoughts about uh, the, giving birth to a giant and uh, we said the Gravit Hospital reported a new record, a bouncing 55-pound baby boy. Uh, Dr. Tucker said it was the first time that the baby slapped him before he could slap the baby. So anyway, that, we had a little fun with that. There is an historical letter from Pontius Pilate to Tiberius Caesar describing what Jesus looked like with golden hair and blue eyes. Do you believe this letter is valid? What is your educated guess? I don't know if the letter is valid. The letter is interesting, if nothing else, from an historical perceptive. Lastly, when I have trouble forgiving myself and a bad memory pops in my head, I take that moment to thank God for forgiving me and am able to get out of my mind. He is love. Yes, He is love. God bless you and thanks for your comments. Johnny in Arizona. Where in the Bible can I find scripture about if I was married more than once, will I be forgiven of that and is that a sin? Make a note, uh, Johnny, of John uh, chapter 8, verse 1 in the following verses. And there was a woman there who was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And they brought him, you know, the Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, brought her before Jesus and said, The law of Moses says we should stone her to death. What say you? And Jesus kneeled down and started writing in the dirt. And it's not written what he wrote in the dirt, but I guess that it was something like, uh, John, 
I saw you with the widow Smith last weekend over by so-and-so, and John got up and left. Uh, Ralph, I saw you, and then da 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 and on and so forth. When he got through, no one was left. And he stood up to the woman, and he said, Woman, where are thy accusers? And she said, I know not, my Lord. And he said, Neither do I. Go forth and sin no more. My point is that Jesus forgave her of adultery. And, and that's what some people say, that if you're married more than one time, that you're doing is committing adultery. So to answer your question, yes, Jesus can forgive adultery. Arlene in Nebraska. In the Bible, I have read about a woman who boiled her son and ate him. How could she have done such a thing? I could not have done that to any of my children. Well, uh, that's hard to imagine for sure, but uh, it did happen. And in fact, is it was prophesied that it would happen uh, at the time of Moses in the book of uh, Leviticus chapter 26, where you have the blessings and curses. God said, if you walk contrary to me, I'll walk contrary to you seven times. And I'll make it so bad that you eat your own children. Well, it came uh, to pass when uh, Benadad, the king of Syria, was laying siege to Samaria. And there was a king of Israel named Joram. And uh, there was a lady that came complaining to the king saying, this woman agreed that we would eat her son yesterday or my son yesterday and her son today. Now she won't give her son. So it came to pass. Uh, when they laid siege to a city, uh, they basically surrounded the city and kept anything from going in or out of the city. Uh, when the food ran out, people got desperate. Rachel in Florida. If someone wasn't baptized and they pass away, can someone else be baptized in their place? And the answer to that is no. Uh, some people read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 29, and believe that someone could be baptized for the dead, but they're misunderstanding that verse. What Paul's teaching us there in 1 Corinthians 15 is that if Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, why are you baptized in a dead man's or for the dead? Meaning, why would you want to be baptized in Jesus' name if he's still uh, six feet under? You know, he's not six feet under. He resurrected. And baptism being symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But uh, Jesus... Uh, let me back up and say, everyone's salvation is between them and the Lord. Uh, you can't uh, be uh, in, involved in somebody's salvation who's already passed on. Addie in Georgia, I want to thank you all and thank you for your kind comments. Um, get down to your question, how do we keep bad thoughts out of our minds? I pray to God to help me not think these things. I study the Bible with Shepherd's Chapel uh, once in the morning, then at noon to three, then at night right before I go to sleep. I read a Bible verse. I love reading the Word of God. And last, or lost is the scripture. I totally block out everything that's my quiet time. Okay, well, fill your mind with God in His Word, and you, boy, you're 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 you got a large appetite for studying God's Word if you study in the morning, at noon, and at night. So, but that's you know if you if you if Jesus and the Holy Spirit are in you, uh, bad stuff doesn't want to be around you because you're filled with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So you're doing fine. Mary from Kentucky, question, I have watched movies of the crucifixion of Christ. In some of them, they show a man helping Jesus pick up his cross when he drops it. The soldiers pick this man to help him. Is this biblical? If so, uh, who was he? Well, you can read about it in Matthew 
uh, chapter 27, verse 32, and the following verses. And it states there that the man was a man of Cyrene, which is a uh, country in northern Africa. So, uh, yes, you're right. When Jesus had lost so much blood from the beatings and the thorns in his, his forehead, uh, he just didn't have the strength to carry the cross anymore. And they had the man of Cyrene carry it up to Golgotha. Brian in Virginia, <coughs> can Satan rapture people? Well, Brian, Satan will be uh, supernatural. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14 tells us he'll be able to snap his fingers and make lightning come down from heaven. So uh, he will be able to do miracles on earth. That's how he's going to deceive the people of earth is by his miracles, as it states there in Revelation chapter 13. Are you spiritually and uh, mentally ready for those uh, miracles? You better have your gospel armor on. Rose in Tennessee, I've been blind for 10 years. Is God mad at me? No, God is not mad at you, Rose. Um, Father may very well have a reason that you're blind, uh, as he did with the man that we learn about in John chapter 9, verse 1, and the following verses. And they had one there who was blind from birth. And his disciples, Jesus' disciples, asked him, who sinned? Was it the parents of this man or the man himself? And Jesus said, neither. Uh, the parents sinned or he sinned. He is blind that the works of God may be made manifest in him. That means to be made known in him. So uh, I'm sure God has a reason that, that you, you have this uh, disability and I, I pray that you have been able to deal with it and, and get on with your life. Uh, God loves you, I know that. John in Connecticut. Why don't all the churches teach us about the birth of Christ being in September? It's so plain when you teach it. Have they ever taught that? Did they stop teaching that when they started uh, bringing Santa Claus into the picture? Was that the store's slow time so they make up Santa so people would have to shop and buy Christmas gifts every year? Thank you for reading my concerns, and I'm sure my questions will be answered at some point. Well, yep, yours is up today. And to answer your question, I think people don't teach it because they don't realize it. Uh, they don't understand it. That's, that's the reason that uh, churches, pastors, uh, reverends, men, women of the cloth, I believe, don't teach the book of Revelation. It's because they don't understand it themselves well enough to teach it. So uh, you have been taught, and, and you say it's so uh, simple and easy, so plain, you said, and, and that means you're probably, uh, you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Many people today don't. You're, you're fortunate, be sure, and thank your Heavenly Father. Valerie in Pennsylvania, is it okay to forgive God for not making me perfect? I have one verse for you, Valerie. It's called Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16. It reads, surely your turning things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? Bowery, the Lord doesn't need your forgiveness. Uh, you need his. Alfred in Georgia, what do you think about social media? I avoid it like the plague. Roy in Louisiana, what is Jesus talking about when he said, thou will do even greater works than I? And John chapter 14, verse 12. He said, stated, verily, verily, he said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. I think Jesus knew that one day 
uh, a studio uh, such as Shepherd's Chapel is, would be able to hit a few buttons, the technicians, and send the word of God around the world, basically, via the internet, uh, via television, via uh, other means of, of formats that our program appears around the world. I think Jesus knew that that was one day going to be possible. You know, he could speak and 5,000 people uh, about the most could hear, but we speak and literally millions and millions can hear the word of God. David in Tennessee, how does, a past, how does the pastor uh, feel about living wills? I think it's very important. Uh, they're also known as Advanced Healthcare Directive, H, excuse me, AHD. And it allows for uh, you to clearly communicate with your loved ones how you want things to go as you end uh, near the end of your life. And if you don't want to go on life support machines, you have the right to say so. And you know what? That's a tremendous load off of your children if they're the ones that are having to make those decisions. So uh, they will know what you want in advance and be able to, to meet your wishes. They won't have to be guessing if you become incapacitated. I'm out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know what? It makes your father's day when he looks down and he sees you reading the letter he wrote to you, seeking knowledge of him and how you can be pleasing to him. It makes his day and blessings always follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. There's one thing, beloved, that's most important, and it's this. You stay in the Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.